Vectors Part 2. Meow, 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 pew, pew. I don't know if you guys ever watched Superstore. It's a show. Probably haven't. But there's this guy that's in there. He always does that. Pew, 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 when he's walking around. Anyway, uh, yep, we're back. This is from a, a very, very old movie that uh, starred this guy here. was one of the best basketball players of all time. Anyway, they talk about this. Roger, Roger, which are Vector, Victor. They keep going over. It's a really dumb joke, but for some reason, I found it hilarious. And hey, how many Vector jokes are out there? Not many. But again, Vectors and Planes, the movie's called Airplane, Vectors and Planes, Vectors are all about what? A direction and a magnitude. That's planes, right? They fly in a direction. They fly with magnitude. They have some kind of distance they're traveling. So, very relevant. All right. Here we go. Let's talk about unit vectors. What are unit vectors and why are they so important? And, well, you know, here's the thing. Sometimes we like to break things down into length of one, right? So if I had a vector that was exactly to one zero or my vector was one comma zero, that'd be a unit vector. It'd have a magnitude of one. I could also have it go up here, have a magnitude of one. So it's important we want to find out when is it going to be a unit vector for any vector. Let's find any vector. So we're going to go the direction and make it a unit vector. So the first thing we have to do is we have our vector and essentially we're just going to divide it by our distance, our magnitude, excuse me. All right. So what, how do we do that? Well, we know how to find magnitude. I do the X component squared plus the Y component squared. So all this is saying is now that we take our vector and we're going to divide it by our magnitude. Division is the same thing as multiplying by 1 over radical 34, right? So I'm going to distribute it in here. 3 over radical 34 and 5 over radical 34. Now at some point in the distant past, you were told never, ever have a square root on the bottom of a fraction. Never want to have a radical. Well, um, that's simply because it was easier to divide. It's easier to divide numbers without radicals in the denominator. But I'll tell you what, it's not really that important right now in terms of uh, finding these unit vectors. So we're going to leave these radicals in here. This is the one time I'm, I'm going to allow it. Now, if your teacher says, oh, Pish posh, that Mr. Sullivan from flipmouth.com doesn't know anything. And I want you to make sure you know how to radicalize these fractions and blah, blah, blah. Then do it. Like, it's not that hard. You should know how to do this from Algebra 1 or Algebra 2 or pre-calculus, right? We multiply by the radical. And if you can reduce, you reduce, but we can't. All it is is this was easier to, to divide by hand. Now we have calculators that do it, so it's not that important, in my opinion. But again, your teacher knows best, so listen to them, okay? All right, the dot product for vectors. This is kind of like multiplying vectors, but not scalar multiplying. It's called the dot product. All right, a couple of ways we can do this. First of all, we are going to take the components, the x components, multiply them together. And then we're going to add the y components. So this is method one, finding the dot product. That is super easy. Okay? The other way we can do it is we can find the magnitude of the first vector, find the magnitude of the second vector, and multiply it by the angle between them. Now, sometimes you'll just have the magnitudes and the angle. Sometimes you'll have the vectors themselves. All right? The result of this is going to be a single number. And that number is just a, uh, a scalar of the two vectors. It kind of combines them and points them in a direction that, uh, that scales it. It just, it just gives us a scalar number, excuse me, no direction. All right. But really, why do we want to use this? Well, this actually helps us magnificently. I love that word. To find the angle between the two vectors. So let's take a look. So it says find the angle between the two vectors. So now I know a couple of things. I know one way to find it would be to do a1 
times A2 plus B1 times B2. And I know that is the same as finding the, I'm going to call this U and this V. All right. The magnitude of U times the magnitude of V times cosine of the theta, the angle between them. All right, so let's see what I can do here. I have negative 3 times 2 plus 4 times 6. So this is negative 6 plus 24, which is 18. All right, great job. All right, over here on the side, let's find some magnitudes. So let's find the magnitude of u. The magnitude of u is negative 3 squared, 9, plus 4 squared, 16, right? And that gives us 9 plus 16, 25. Ooh, look at that. That's nice and neat. 5. Let's find the magnitude of V. The magnitude of V is 2 squared, 4, plus 6 squared, 36, which is 40. And I'm going to leave it as 40. I'm not going to simplify it or anything like that. I'm just going to put these in here. So 5 times square root of 40 times the cosine of theta. All right, so I'm going to bring this down. Now I have 5 radical 40 times the cosine of theta. I'm going to divide both sides by 5 radical 40. At this point, this is calculator work. So I'm going to divide 18 divided by 5 radical 40. Make sure this whole thing is in the denominator. All right. So what I get there is 0.569, all right? Now, for those of you at home, this is definitely not all of what I'm doing, right? There's many, many more decimal places. So the next part of this, when I do this, I need you to understand, I'm not putting in 0.569. I'm putting in everything in my calculator. Everything in my calculator was 0.569209978880, and it goes forever. That's what I'm putting in. So if you put in just 0.569, you're going to round too soon. Don't round too soon. So I need to find the inverse of that, right? And that'll give me my angle. And when I did that, I found that my angle was 55.3 degrees. All right. So again, let's think about this. What does this represent? So negative 3 one, two, three, up four, one, two, three, four, like this vector. This is just an approximation. And this vector, one, two, and up six. Again, I didn't draw it perfectly. They're saying the angle between them right here, that equals 55.3 degrees. Now, it's actually pretty close, doesn't it? All right. So you try this one. Maybe sketch it out at the end to see, or maybe sketch it out at the beginning to see what you think it might be. But you go ahead and try this one on your own. So over here, I found the magnitudes. I got the magnitude of A was radical 34, and the magnitude of B was radical 136. I plugged in my formulas on this. I noticed that on the, the left side, the easy side, I got 30 plus negative 30 or 0. Over here, when I multiplied my magnitudes together, remember, when they're both under a square root, you can multiply them together. So I got 4,624, square root of that. Divide, I got 0 equals cosine of theta. Well, I know that when cosine is zero, that's a 90 degree angle. Now, if you didn't remember that, shame on you. But if you didn't remember that, you could have put that in your calculator and you would have found that it was 90 degrees. So let's, uh, you know, just do a quick check, see how close I can get here on my drawing. Five, negative three, one, two, three, four, five, three. By the way, this is not gonna be close at all because I already missed my dot. Six, that's five, six, and up ten. I don't know, somewhere here. That's missed that dot on purpose, but that's about 90 degrees. All right. Now, a special thing here. When two vectors are perpendicular, we call them orthogonal. All right. Because obviously, like 90 degrees, that's very special. Like, ha ha ha, special. So when that's special, we call them orthogonal. Because of course we have to name everything. We're mathematicians, right? All righty. Now, the next thing I'm going to tell you is we're going to use these two laws. One is called the law of cosines, and one is called the law of sines. We're going to use these for real-world application questions. I know. You're really excited. Me too. All right. Here we go. 
So the law of cosines, we're going to use it when we have two vectors and the angle between them, and we want to find the magnitude between them, all right? So for example, I have this angle here. I know this is angle C. I have this magnitude and this magnitude. So I have two magnitudes and the magnitude between them. And I want to find, or excuse me, the angle between them. I want to find the other magnitude. Maybe I should write the third magnitude, right? All right. So that's when I would use this. Oh, it's super long. C squared equals A squared plus B squared minus 2AB times cosine of C. Oh, no. When will I ever be able to remember that? Um, we'll probably put it on the master check for you. Okay. But if your teacher doesn't let you, just memorize it. Come on. Step up. Be a boss. Memorize it. Not that hard. The law of sines is much easier. The way we're going to use it. And all it says is this. If I know, if I have two vectors and two angles opposite, so I know this angle, and I know the magnitude opposite, and I know this angle, and I know the, the opposite, or I could do this. I know this one, and it's opposite. As long as I know an angle and it's opposite twice, I can use this, which is the sine of A over A, and the sine of B over B. And the A's, the capital A's stand for the angles, lowercase stands for the magnitude of the vector, or in this case, you know, the side of a triangle. All right. These law of cosines and law of sines are real laws that apply to triangles, and there's a lot more to them. And right now I'm telling you, sorry, we're not going to go that in depth. We're going to use them for vectors. If you want to study more about the law of cosines or the law of sines, highly recommend it. Go to our non-AP course, and there's stuff in there for you. All right. But before we get to that, let's take a look how we can use them. All right, a plane leaves the airport heading 20 degrees south of east. Oh, boy, oh, boy. All right, let's take a look. So, I have coordinates. All right, 20 degrees south of east. So, this is east. This is south. This is north. This is west. If you don't know that, I'm really sorry. So, I'm going to just draw this 20 degrees. It's going this way. So, this is 20 degrees south of east. And this magnitude, my speed, is 600 miles per hour. A wind is blowing at the same time 40 degrees north at 25 miles per hour. All right? Now, I am going to draw this parallelogram here. And I know this is 600. And I know this is 25. And I know... That this diagonal here, this result right here, that is the true path of my plane. So I'm going to draw that in triangle. So I have 25, I have 600, and this is my true path here, right? All right, so I'm going to find that. Now, let's think about this. If, you, if you're thinking about it, I'm flying this way. And the wind is pushing me this way, but is also kind of pushing me, making it a little bit faster. So my result should be a little bit more, correct? All right. Um, and my angle, you can see it's going to be here. All right. So I need to find that as well. So things I know. I know this was 40. I know this was this whole thing was 20, right? But what do I know about my angles? Hmm. I need to think about that, don't I? I don't really know this angle, do I? But I know this whole angle here is 60. And I know that when I have a quadrilateral, which is what I drew, I drew a parallelogram, that angles that are consecutive like this next to each other, adjacent, add up to 180. So if this angle is 20 plus 40, 60, then this angle here, which is this angle, must be 180 minus 60 or 120. Now, that's all I know. But I have the law of cosines. The law of cosines, which is c squared, equals a squared plus b squared minus 2 times uh, a and b times the cosine of c. Do I have two sides and the angle between them? I sure do. Let's see what I can do here. So I'm going to plug these in. 25 squared plus 600 squared minus 2 times 25 times 600 
times the cosine of 120. 25 squared plus 600 squared. That should give me ooh, a big old number. 306. Nope, excuse me. See, this is why I always make mistakes. I can't read my own. 360,625. 2 times 25 times 600 is 30,000 times cosine of 120. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm just going to put all that in my calculator, and I come up with this number here, 375,625. That equals my c squared. Take the square root of that, and I found out that that magnitude of, the, of that vector is going to be 612.9. So this is 612.9. Well, isn't that spectacular? That is magnitude, which is our miles per hour. So now the plane isn't flying at 600 miles per hour. It's actually flying at 600 and almost 13 miles per hour. Now, <clears throat> we need to figure out some angles here. I need to find this angle here because this whole angle here is you know, um, 60, I know that because 40 and 20, but I need to find what we're missing here, right? So I need to find kind of this angle here with the horizon, like this is east, right? And I need to find what this is here, but I can't do that until I find that whole big angle. So I'm going to do sine of theta, law of sines, sine of this over its opposite, equals, do I have another one? Yep. I have sine of 120 and it's opposite 612.9. All right. Let's delineate these two. All right. So I'm going to multiply that by 600. So sine of theta equals 600 times sine of 120 over 612. Now, at this point, it's probably pretty smart to actually use a calculator, and here's why. These are some big numbers here that we've already rounded, and we don't like to use numbers that we've rounded again. You really only want to round at the end if possible. So when I put my square root of that big number in here, I got this number, right? I want to use that number if I can. So I have 600 times. Now I'm going to put my seven, sine of 720 divided by that. And to do that, I'm just going to go up, highlight it, press enter. Now. Make sure I close my parentheses. It looks like it's just that exactly. And some of you are like, I'm just going to put in the decimal. And yes, that would be an okay option. But when I click on that, even those decimals that are not written but are stored in the calculator come down here and calculate it. It makes it the most accurate you can possibly have. So then we have this. So we have uh, then uh, we have sine of theta. Let's go back over here. We have sine theta equaling, and again, I'm going to round this. I'm just going to put 0 0.848, 0 0.848. But when I do the inverse sign here, I'm actually going to, you know, use the whole decimal again. Why? I want to be as precise as I can, right? So I'm going to do second sign, and I'm going to come up here, grab that decimal, Press enter, and then we get 57.9. So at this point, is a good time to round. So I'm going to say it's 58 degrees. So our theta is 58 degrees. So what does this mean? All right, so if we go back to our diagram here, remember we knew this was 120. So we knew this whole angle here was 60. We knew that this part of that angle was 40 from the original. So we know this here has to be 20, but we want this angle right here, right? So if this whole thing we, is what we just found. We just found this part of it, not the whole 60, but this part of it, and that was 58 degrees. So 40 or 58, take away the 40 you already have, so our angle is going to be 18 degrees. So our answer is actually going to be 18 degrees, and then in the direction would be south of... And we're headed east, so south of east. And there you have it. All right, best of luck. Remember, ask lots of questions. 
Uh, this is a great, great time for you to get better at that as you further your mathematical career. Dream big. See you next time.